Hello, everybody. I was... I'm wearing a tie today. What could it mean? Probably nothing. I just like looking fancy. Hi, everybody. Happy Monday. Welcome back to school. You have all done an amazing job on your essays. I'm hoping and assuming... But regardless, we're moving on to a new unit. This new unit is going to be what I like to call survival and the inner human demon that lurks within us all. What does that look like? Well, next week we're going to be going into a novel study, but this week we're going to be looking at a variety of short stories and articles that we're going to dissect and pick apart. So, before we get back into the realm of reading stories and articles, let's go ahead and review what the different kinds of points of view are and why point of views matter, why point of view matters in a story of any kind. So, as you know, we've already gone over points of view, so this is going to be a very quick review of the different kinds. More specifically, though, we're going to be asking ourselves, how does point of view actually matter in a story? How can point of view emphasize the message that an author is trying to get across? So, let's go ahead and get into some of these quick notes, a bit of a review. The different kinds of points of view that we have. We have first person, when a story is told, um, from the perspective of an, a narrator using I, me, we sort of thing. In that case, the narrator is usually an active character in the story itself. For second person, which is kind of weird, you use you. The narrator is you, your. Um, and when a narrator does that, the reader is a character in the story. The reader is kind of broken through that wall that we usually maintain between our world and the story and is kind of drawn into it that way. And third person is when you use he, she, or it, and the narrator is not a character in the story. To emphasize this, if you were to take a look at this picture, if a story is told from the perspective of this guy right here, it's in first person. If the story is being told from the perspective of this camera that's just sort of looking at all of the characters and may or may not have access to their thoughts as well, then it's third person point of view. So. Why does point of view matter in a story? Well, the point of view reveals a, to the reader who the narrator is in relation to the story. And the point of view also gives us access or maybe doesn't let us access the thoughts and feelings of certain characters. Point of view can add suspense or change the tone of a story, especially when you'd like don't know all of the thoughts of the characters or only know the thoughts of one character, it's usually harder to tell what the future holds for that character. And the point of view also shows us the credibility of the narrator, aka, can the narrator be trusted? For example, if you are reading a story from a third person point of view, then um, for the most part, you can probably assume the narrator is telling the truth about the situation. But if a story is being told from first person, then the narrator might not always be telling the truth. Or maybe the narrator is going to be so focused on one thing that they're missing some other part of the story. This is known as bias. Bias. B-I-A-S. And that's actually going to be an answer to one of the guided notes in the, in the movie. Why is first person narration significant? Because everybody has bias. Everybody has preconceived ideas of what matter in life, what matters in life and what's important to tell in a story. So whenever you see a story being narrated from first person point of view, pay attention to that. Maybe ask yourself, hmm, what does the narrator hold to be important? Speaking of questions, there's actually a whole long list of questions that you can ask yourself when you see that the narr that the story is told in first person. Now, I'm going to provide a copy of these notes. I'm going to put a link down in the uh, form, the Google form, so you can access these. But a couple of questions I want you to consider. And you know what? Actually, I'll just go ahead and twiddle my thumbs for about 10 seconds. I'm going to let you guys read through these first-person point-of-view questions that you're going to be asking yourself. And go ahead and pause the video if you need a little bit more time to read through some of these questions.
and moving on. Some of the biggest takeaways that you should grab from this is in what way is bias affecting the character if they are telling the story in first person? What are some things that the narrator focuses or fixates on in the story? What is the most important thing to that character and why? All of these things help us figure out what the main message of the story is that the author is trying to convey to us. So let's go ahead and read through The Man in the Well. I'm going to post a uh, recording of this that you can listen along to. There's also a PDF though. I encourage you to read along in person. Not gonna lie, this story is kind of creepy and kind of shocking as well. I'm excited to see what you folks think about how the children in this story react to seeing the man in the well. The Man in the Well by Ira Shear. I was nine when I discovered the man in the well in an abandoned farm lot near my home. I was with a group of friends playing hide and go seek or something when I found the well and then I heard the voice of the man in the well calling out for help. I think it's important that we decided not to help him. Everyone, like myself, was probably on the verge of fetching a rope or asking where we could find a ladder. But then we looked around at each other and it was decided. I don't remember if we told ourselves a reason why we couldn't help him, but we had decided then. Because of this, I never went very close to the lip of the well, or I only came up on my hands and knees so that he couldn't see me. And just as we wouldn't allow him to see us, I know that none of us ever saw the man in the well. The well was too dark for that, too deep. Even when the sun was high up, angling light down the stone sides like golden hair. I remember that we were full of games and laughter when we called down to him. He had heard us shouting while we were playing, and he'd been hollering for us to come. He was so relieved at that moment. God, get me out. I've been here for days. He must have known we were children because he immediately instructed us to go get a ladder, get help. At first, afraid to disobey the voice from the man in the well, we turned around and actually began to walk toward the nearest house, which was Arthur's. But along the way, we slowed down and then we stopped and after waiting what seemed like a good while, we quietly came back to the well. We stood or lay around the lip, listening for maybe half an hour, and then Arthur, after some hesitation, called down. What's your name? This, after all, seemed like the most natural question. The man answered back immediately. Do you have the ladder? We all looked at Arthur, and he called back down. No, we couldn't find one. Now that we had established some sort of a dialogue, everyone had questions he or she wanted to ask the man in the well, but the man wouldn't stop speaking. Go tell your parents there's someone in this well. If they have a rope or a ladder, he trailed off. His voice was raw and sometimes he would cough. Just tell your parents. We were quiet, but this time no one stood up or moved. Someone, I think little Jason, called down. Hello? Is it dark? And then after a moment, can you see the sky? He didn't answer, but instead told us to go again. When we were quiet for a bit, he called to see if we had gone. After a pause, Wendy crawled right to the edge so that her hair lifted slightly in the updraft. Is there any water down there? Have they gone for help? He asked. She looked around at us and then called down. Yes, they're gone now. Isn't there any water down there? I don't think anyone smiled at how easy it was to deceive him. This was, in too, this was too important. Isn't there? She said again. No, he said. It's very dry. <clears throat> he cleared his throat. Do you think it will rain? She stood up and took the whole sky in with her blue eyes, making sure. No, I don't think so. We heard him coughing in the well, and we waited for a while, thinking about him waiting in the well. Resting on the grass and cement by the well, I tried to picture him. I tried to imagine the gesture of his hands reaching to cover his mouth each time he coughed. 
or perhaps he was too tired to make that gesture each time. After an hour, he began calling again, but for some reason we didn't want to answer. We got up and began running, filling up with panic as we moved, until we were racing across the ruts of the old field. I kept turning, stumbling, as I looked behind. Perhaps he heard us getting up and running away from the well. Only Wendy stayed by the well for a while, watching us run as his calling grew louder and wilder, until finally she ran too, and then we were all far away. The next morning we came back, most of us carrying bread or fruit or something to eat in our pockets. Arthur brought a canvas bag from his house and a plastic jug of water. When we got to the well, we stood around quietly for a moment, listening for him. Maybe he's asleep, Wendy said. We sat down around the mouth of the well on the old concrete slab, warming in the sun and coursing with ants and tiny insects. Aaron called down then, when everyone was comfortable, and the man answered right away, as if he'd been listening to us the whole time. Did your parents get help? Arthur kneeled at the edge of the well and called out, Watch out! and then he let the bag fall after holding it out for a moment, maybe for the man to see. It hit the ground more quickly than I had expected. That, combined with a feeling that he could hear everything we said, made him suddenly closer, as if he might be able to see us. I wanted to be very quiet, so that if he heard or saw anyone, he would not notice me. The man in the well started coughing, and Arthur volunteered. There's some water in the bag. We all brought something. We could hear him moving around down there. After a few minutes, he asked us, When are they coming? What did your parents say? We all looked at each other, aware that he couldn't address anyone in particular. He must have understood this because he called out in his thin, groping voice, What are your names? No one answered until Aaron, who was the oldest, said, My father said he's coming with the police and he knows what to do. We admired Aaron very much for coming up with this on the spot. Are they on their way? The man in the well asked. We could hear that he was eating. My father said, don't worry, because he's coming with the police. Little Jason came up next to Aaron and asked, what's your name? Because we, didn't still, we still didn't know what to call him. When we talked among ourselves, he had simply become the man. He didn't answer, so Jason asked him how old he was. And then Grace came up to and asked him something I don't remember. We all asked such stupid questions, and he wouldn't answer any and he wouldn't answer anyone. Finally, we all stopped talking and we lay down on the cement. It was a hot day, so after a while Grace got up, and then little Jason and another young boy, Robert, I think, and went to town to sit in the cool movie theater. That was what we did most afternoons back then. After an hour, Everyone had left except Wendy and myself, and I was beginning to think that I would go too. He called up to us all of a sudden. Are they coming now? Yes, said Wendy, looking at me, and I nodded my head. She sounded certain. I think they're almost here. Aaron said his dad is almost here. As soon as she said it, she was sorry, because she'd broken one of the rules. I could see it on her face eyes filling with space as she moved back from the well. Now he had one of our names. She said, they're going to come to cover up the mistake. But there it was, and there was nothing to do about it. The man in the well didn't say anything for a few minutes. Then he surprised us again by asking, is it going to rain? Wendy stood up, turned around like she had done the other day, but the sky was clear. No, she said. Then he asked again, they're coming, you said, Aaron's dad. And he shouted, right? So that we jumped and stood up and began running away, just as, we had done, just as we had done the day before. We could hear him shouting for a while, and we were afraid someone might hear. I thought that toward the end, maybe he said he was sorry, but I never asked Wendy what she thought he'd said. Everyone was there again on the following morning. It was all I could think about during supper the night before, and then the anticipation in the morning over breakfast. My mother was very upset with something at the time. I could hear her weeping at night in her room downstairs, 
and the stubborn murmur of my father. There was a feeling to those days, months, actually, that I can't describe without resorting to the man in the well, as if through a great whispering, like a gathering of clouds or a long sound, the turbulent wreck of the ocean. At the well, we put together the things to eat we had smuggled out, but we haven't, hadn't even gotten them all in the bag when the voice of the man in the well soared and sh soared out sharply. They're on their way now. We stood very still so that he couldn't hear us, but I knew what was coming and I couldn't do anything to soften the blur of the words of his voice. Aaron, he pronounced, and I imagined him practicing that voice all night long and holding it in his mouth so that he wouldn't let it slip away in his sleep. Aaron lost all the color in his face, and he looked at us with suspicion, as if we had somehow taken on a part of the man in the well. I didn't even glance at Wendy. We were both too embarrassed. Neither of us said anything. We were all quiet then. Arthur finished assembling the bag, and we could see his hands shaking as he dropped it into the well. We heard the man in the well moving around. After ten minutes or so, Grace called down to him. What's your name? But someone pulled her back from the well, and we became silent again. Today, the question humiliated us with its simplicity. There was no sound for a while from the well, except for the cloth noises and the scraping the man in the well made as he moved around. Then he called out in a pleasant voice, Aaron, what do you think my name is? Aaron, who had been very still this whole time, looked around at all of us again. We knew he was afraid. His fingers were pulling with a separate life at the collar of his shirt. And maybe because she felt badly for him, Wendy answered instead. Is your name Charles? It sounded inane, but the man in the well answered, No. She thought for a moment. Edgar? No. No. Little Jason called out. David? No, said the man in the well. Then Aaron, who had been absolutely quiet, said, Arthur, in a small, clear voice, and we all started. I could see Arthur was furious, but Aaron was bigger and older than he was, and nothing could be said or done without giving himself his name away. We knew the man in the well was listening for the changes in our breath, anything. Aaron didn't look at Arthur or anyone. And then he began giving all of our names, one at a time. We all watched him, trembling, our faces, the faces that I had seen, pasted on the spectators in the freak tent when the circus had come to town. We were watching such a deformity take place before our eyes, and I remember the spasm of anger when he said my name and felt the man in the well soak it up. Because the man in the well understood, the man in the well didn't say anything now. When Aaron was done, we all waited for the man in the well to speak up. I stood on one leg and then the other, and eventually I sat down. We had to wait for an hour, and today no one wanted to leave to lie in the shade or hide in the velvet movie seats. At last, the man in the well said, All right then, Arthur, what do you think I look like? We heard him cough a couple of times, and then a sound like the smacking of lips. Arthur, who was sitting on the ground with his chin propped on his fists, didn't say anything. How could he? I knew I couldn't answer myself if the man in the well called me by name. He called a few of us, and I watched the shutter move from face to face. Then he was quiet for a while. It was afternoon now, and the light was changing, withdrawing from the well. It was as if the well was filling up with earth. The man in the well moved around a bit, and then he called Jason. He asked, How old do you think I am, Jason? He didn't seem to care that no one would answer, or he seemed to expect that no one would. He said, Wendy, are they coming now? Is Aaron's dad coming now? He walked around a bit. We heard him rummage in the bag of food, and he said, All right, what's my name? He used everyone's name. He asked everyone. When he said my name, I felt the water clouding my eyes, and I wanted to throw stones, dirt, down the well to crush out his voice. But we couldn't do anything. None of us did, because then he would know. In the evening, we could tell he was getting tired. He wasn't saying much, and seemed to have lost interest in us. Before we left that day, 
as we were rising quietly and looking at the dark shadows of the trees we had to move through to reach our homes, he said, Why didn't you tell anyone? He coughed. Didn't you want to tell anyone? Perhaps he heard the hesitation in our breaths, but he wasn't going to help us now. It was almost night then, and we were spared the detail of having to see and read each other's faces. That night it rained, and I listened to the rain on the roof and my mother sobbing downstairs until I fell asleep. After that, we didn't play by the well anymore, even when we were much older. We didn't go back. I will never go back.